is Alexandra Stern. I'm a professor in American culture, history, women's studies, and obstetrics and gynecology. Um, and I'm the previous director of the Latin American and Caribbean Studies Center, as well as the Brazil Initiative. I also am the coordinator of the U University of Michigan Fio Cruz Partnership, um, which is a very robust partnership, a uh, very interdisciplinary partnership involving historians, epidemiologists, um, sociologists, um, uh, historians, anthropologists, and more. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here in this capacity uh, to introduce Dr. Selena Turchi for the Brazil Initiative Lecture of 2018. I would like to um, thank Dr. Selena Turchi for traveling a long distance to be here with us on this gray and wintry Ann Arbor afternoon. <laughs> You're getting the full experience here. To share her vast knowledge about science and medicine. Um, she's an epidemiologist at the Pio Cruz Foundation, and she's based in Recife, Brazil. She earned her PhD in public health at the Universidade de Sao Paulo, University of Sao Paulo, and she's held many prestigious positions in Brazil and at European <coughs> institutions. She's led and participated in dozens of high-level research teams dedicated to studying infectious diseases, and those include dengue, HIV, and a range of other conditions. Um, she's published a vast list of publications, which I printed out here. I won't read them all to you in my <laughs> subpar Portuguese, but um, you know, over a hundred peer-reviewed publications um, in her very distinguished career. Most recently, she's turned her attention to Zika, um, which began in 2015 when evidence was emerging that infections caused by mosquito bites were resulting in the birth of babies with microcephaly and a range of other neurological and developmental conditions. She did what leaders in epi epidemiology do. She connected science with disease surveillance, and she also did what leaders in public health do. She studied patterns and context, and in this case, looked at the disease in its social and uh, clinical ecosystem in northeastern Brazil. So she was really there in real time, kind of at the cutting edge of studying the very first manifestations of what we call now call Zika. And one of the things she realized that this was a new disease with a very global impact and potential. Um, that being said, you know, she soon expanded her work to include and to connect with the existing partnerships she had on regional, national, and global levels. And one of the things that you know, is really notable about her is how she should, like she's doing with us today, she shared information in real time with global partners. And that was so important in understanding this emerging disease. Um, she was recognized for this significant work in Time Magazine, where she was named one of the most influential people in 2017. So I could read you many more accolades and accomplishments of Dr. Selena Turchi, but I think now we want to hear from her. Uh, we want to learn from her lessons and her experience. And she is going to uh, tell them, tell us about them in her talk, which is titled The Zika Crisis in Brazil, A Case Study of Interdisciplinary Approaches to Public Health. So with that, welcome. First, I would like to thank Professor Alexandra Stern for her generous and kind words. Uh, Director Victoria Langland and Bebete Martins for the invitation. I thank you very much for this opportunity in the name of Fiocruz Pernambuco and the Microcephaly Epidemic Research Group. The organizer here proposed a discussion about the Zika crisis in Brazil as a case study of interdisciplinary approach to public health. That I found a very appropriate title. It was indeed a public health and social crisis that has been required interdisciplinary approach. As an epidemiologist, I was at the front line of this unprecedented microcephaly outbreak in the northeast of Brazil in 2015. So I would like to share from the Brazilian perspectives, from the detection of the first microcephaly cases, the main hypothesis and the evidence of congenital transmission of Zika virus, 
and something about the ongoing epidemiological projects and the challenges ahead. Uh, first, I would like to just a brief comment about the epidemiological contest of, of the arbovirus disease in these urban environments. Dengue was considered the major public health problem in the beginning of 2015. More than 1.5 million cases and around 900 deaths were reported in Brazil. So Brazil was and is still considered among the most dengue endemic affected countries in the America with the co-circulation of the four serotypes, dengue 1 to dengue 4. Climate and environmental conditions favor all year round transmission with marked seasonal patterns and large epidemics. In 2013, there was a public health alert of chikungunya, that's, another, that's an alpha virus, following the Caribbean outbreak, and it's a known cause of prolonged arthralgia and disability. And in the beginning of 2015, a surprising outbreak of myoexantematic disease identified first as just dengue-like occurred in northeast of disease. It's a mysterious disease retrospectively identified as the first Zika epidemic in Brazil. This outbreak was followed shortly by Guillain-Barré syndrome, that is a severe and a rare neurologic um, complication. And then microcephaly epidemic of a known cause appeared. So if we look at this map, I don't know if you can see uh, the circles. The, the circles that are green are the chikungunya circles. And the circles that are red are the Zika. Um, and this is the prediction that we had in 2015. It's still with the question mark in a very prestigious journal like Zika virus, is Zika virus following dengue and chikungunya? So, and if you look at the map and see the big green circles that are the chikungunya, the prediction was that we were going to have great epidemics and expansions of chikungunya. Zika was outside the radar, even in very, early publications in 2015. Now, uh, I'll start from the beginning. So it's Pernambuco State, August 2015. And what happens? This is a timeline. Uh, pediatricians, doctors reported an increased number of neonates with microcephaly in the city of Recife. There were two lady doctors. There were neurologists, and there was a mother and the daughter. So they had close contact, naturally, but worked in different public hospitals. So what we saw that by the end of the year, they had become accumulated a large, a very large number of cases, and it was clear a major outbreak. Microcephaly is not a disease. It just means that the head circumference is not as the size it was expected to be by sex and gestational age. But sometimes it's also related with several other infectious disease etiology. And normally it's a rare disease. And Brazil <coughs> had reported uh, in a time series less than 200 cases of microcephaly over decades. And what we can say, if we looking back retrospectively, is that we had a large pool of susceptible individuals with abundant presence of vector, i.e. gypsy, with adequate environmental condition, 
in densely populated urban settings. These conditions made possible to a range of clinical outcomes to become apparent, like increased number of Guillain-Barré syndromes close in time to the Zika outbreak, and six to six months, seven months later, detection, this detection of space and time cluster of neonates with microcephaly and other birth defects. In November 2015, 11th November, uh, Brazil declared a public health emergency. This public health emergency was declared, it was very, as I think, it was very courageous for the Ministry of Health because we had very no hard evidence that Zika virus infection was related to birth defect at that time. And in February 2016, who just followed this uh, international alert and also declared a public health emergency of international con con concern. The justification was the cluster of microcephaly cases and other neurological disorders in Brazil and the potential for spreading to other countries. Uh, I think that the declaration of status of emergency by Brazilian Minister of Health was a turning point for the public health response and for scientific community mobility. I do believe so. The magnitude of the event, the potential of expansion, broke down institutional barriers, creating a collective solidarity feeling and commitment on sharing data and information. Now, researchers and healthcare providers working together developed new protocols and research instruments. Regionally, epidemiologists, clinicians, health professionals, health authorities, and international researchers uh, worked in close collaboration. We were at that time and now aligned with the Brazilian Ministry of Health and Pan American Health Organization to define preventive strategies. Just a, re a reminder, at the time, there was a major political crisis due to impeachment of the former president, uh, Dilma Rousseff, in Brazil. So I think we were mostly trained to do peacetime research, okay? And this was really a wartime research. We had to acquire technology and to be, and it had to be fast. That was kind of a timing difference, okay. But under the possible assumption of the link between Zika virus infection and birth defect, intervention ranged from mosquito control strategies to recommendation of postponing pregnancy during the outbreak. Can you imagine that, going on TV and saying that the whole country should postpone pregnancy? Or uh, the question, how many months? Huh? Another guidance was safe sex if partner travel to endemic Zika region. <coughs> now, I think this map is very good because here just it starts what we call the epidemic history of Zika. It starts in 2007, just 10 years ago. So the first known outbreak was in Yap State, a, a very tiny place in 2007. And what happened there? Um, Zika was still thought as a mild disease. Uh, there were a high percentage of asymptomatic infection. Six years later, a second Zika outbreak, okay, was in French Polynesia. And it always is still considered a mild disease, a large percentage of symptomatic infection, 
but something happened that was different. For the first time, an increase in cases of Guillain-Barré syndrome following Zika outbreak was reported. So for the first time, they could connect it some kind of neurologic damage with this arbovirus. virus. But both sets are very small and isolated. Just to have an idea, uh, the French Polynesia, the total population is about 250,000 people. So it's a very small place. Now we come to a very large city like Recife here, where there was this large outbreak starting in northeast of Brazil and rapid spread to more than 40 countries of Latin America, getting to the USA, some states of here, like Florida. Now, I would like to say, what microcephaly are we talking about? Okay, so microcephaly was the first reported neonatal clinical finding at the beginning of the epidemic. But as uh, we were told here previously, microcephaly was just the tip of the iceberg in a large spectrum of abnormalities with or without microcephaly are now found, and it's now a, a new syndrome called congenital Zika syndromes. So nowadays, congenital Zika syndrome was added as a new infectious disease, among other infections, that causes congenital abnormality of birth defects, like toxoplasmosis, cytomegalovirus, and so on. But as you can see here, you have a front picture and you have a profile of the same kid. What was really noticed at the beginning was this facial disproportionality here. That faces appears large in comparison with the small heads. Sometimes a very strange skin scalp fold, like that's called cutis girata, that caused by the continuing growth of the skin as there is a little brain tissues or brain developed it slows down. So you have a skin fold uh, that was very peculiar. Umbilical hernia was frequent, foot club, arthrogryposis. And what happened in the beginning, uh, we could see the archaic reflexes were preserved. So most children fed well, could feed, could be uh, breastfeeding. Although some developed dysphagia very early, um, right after birth. Abnormality of neurological examinations, including hypertonia, spasticity, hyperflexia, irritability, tremors, and convulsion. This was really a very whole um, neurological spectrum. Now, neuroimages were very peculiar. What called the attention at the beginning, what the large calcifications, large, they were larger. I used to go to, to the uh, radiologists and they were saying they are not like cytomegalovirus. They are more severe cases. They are extremely there are huge calcifications. Uh, the brain, um, sometimes you just uh, had ventriculomegaly, lysencephaly, and you can name all kinds of, um, and it's hard to know now. There were hearing and visual impairments, and they are present, but it's still hard to know the few full spectrum I mean, the full spectrum of all this disability. So since the beginning of the epidemic, one of the major concerns was to design a, 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 a very solid, a very well-designed study where we could do this linking between infection and this outcome, this birth outcomes. So we delineate this 
case control study, our group, the MERG, and the main uh, objective was to investigate explanation for the space-time cluster in the northeast of Brazil. This study was supported by the Brazilian Minister of Health and PAHO. The protocol was approved by ethical research committees, by both institutions, but it was by fast track. We learned to use the word fast track. We had the emergency. So fast track was our keyword for everything. And it was right, because normally to get a, a ethical committee approval, it takes months. We couldn't wait. We were under emergency. So I may say that this case control study was a Brazilian initiative considering the public health emergency. It was considered a priority research by the Ministry of Health. The main hypothesis, of course, was that Zika infection was causing microcephaly. But there was indeed, okay, the right temporal sequence of a acute infection epidemic, Guillain-Barré, and then six, seven months after the cluster of mi microcephaly. This was a right temporal sequence, but it still had to be proved. Um, other potential uh, explanations like um, larvicide in the drinking water to to kill larves of Aedes aegypti was also a very concern okay, at that moment. And rubella vaccine was also, and these two proposed explanations, they had a very potential health care implications because it meant to stop using larvicides in the tank waters during a vector control, ep a vector borne epidemic, or stop vaccination, and that could be a disaster considering rubella, very well established and documented um, program of prevention. We also had to exclude um, all the disease that were connected. Uh, possible with some microcephalic cases, okay? So we had to screen for toxoplasmosis, rubella, cytomegaly, and syphilis, and we had to exclude this already known disease that caused microcephaly. Now, um, why do we did a case control study? Because normally case control studies are, are faster than cohort studies. And we epidemiologists benefit greatly of having this kind of case control in our toolbox. And actually, case control studies are considered a research in reverse because we start with the outcome and we look, I mean, if the potential exposures were there. It's not the right direction but it's the best we can do during an epidemic, and it starts to be, it had to be um, extensively used in early research to understand the cause of many epidemics, if we can say, for example, AIDS epidemic. So we designed this case control study, something very, um, uh, there was a very interesting and curious thing about this design because we thought we had prospectively, we have to recruit the kids pr prospectively, newborns at birth, and concurrent controls in the same uh, area. Because we want to make sure that Zika infection measured was congenital infection and not infection acquired after birth by mosquitoes or by mother secretions. So we had to do it right after birth, probably in the uh, same or the next two days of birth. That's still what's still in the uh, guidelines, how you have to do it. 
So we enrolled neonates, delivered in eight public maternities, okay? as I told, one case for two controls. Cases were neonates with microcephaly, defined by head circumference, at least two standard deviations smaller than the mean for sex and gestational age, considering the phantom growth chart. The controls were live neonates. And live neonates without microcephaly with no brain abnormality identified by ultra transfontanella ultrasonography and no major birth defect detected by physical examination by neonatologists. And controls were selected from the first neonate born matched by expected date of delivery to ensure that cases where controls were conceived at the same stage of the epidemic. This was a very important and a very hard strategy to recruit controls uh, for those cases. We have to make sure that these kids were conceived at the same time, so they would be exposed more or less at the same time. This was the hardest case control I had ever been engaged in my life. Normally they say the case controls are fast and easy to do, but don't believe, sometimes they can be very hard and the designs can be very, tr very uh, interesting, a very, uh, uh, but very laborious work too. And field work was, cons was during the period of January to December 2016. Now I just brought this because I was, it was so important because we had to take specimens from mother cases and controls. We did it at uh, hospital settings, um, of course, after a standard permission uh, of the mother responsible. We had serum plasma for all participants and cerebral spinal fluid just for cases. Of course, we're not going to make interventions to the controls. We wouldn't do anything adverse for the control. And at the, in this case, just because a uh, microcephalic case would benefit about it. So we had molecular testing and we had serology testing. As you know, serological tests are very important in many infectious disease, but we do have an important drawback when we're talking about the flavivirus, because cruciactive antibodies against Zika and Dengue are considered a very important issue at identifying infection for either virus. It means that if we were in a very endemic area of dengue, we would have a lot of cross-reaction with Zika antibodies. So what we had to do was we had to test for PRNT. That's another test that's a uh, very important one, it tests neutralizing antibodies, but not, it's not available in many labs. So this test just tells you the difference between the Zika virus and the all four dengue serotypes. But n as I, I told you, just reference labs and just few reference labs can perform this PRNT test. We are very happy because we had a laboratory there at Fiocruz Recife that was La Vici, and they could, and they were a reference lab for flavivirus. They were connected with the Brazilian lab, lab, labs, a network flavivirus lab, and they were expert and they could perform this test. But it took time because since this was an unexpected epidemic, tests were not available. So 
uh, PCRs had to be made. Um, you had to receive uh, from CDC all the primers and so on. So it took time to get it done. So the laboratory confirmation in our case control study was to be positive by RT-PCR, that means measuring the virus, the viremia, or to be positive by a IgM, Zika, but validated by RT-PCR to be sure there was not cross-reaction. And here I want to point out yesterday, I was in the science lab, and we just discussed about the importance of having this laboratory setups ready when uh, to approach scientific questions and to respond public health emergency timely. Um, so it's really important that the response, the timely response, depends upon the preparedness of the scientific and health professional regional and nationally. Now, if you go to the results, we could see very easy here that the, when the odds is crossed to one, that there was no difference between cases and controls according to the larvae sites in the tank waters or according to the vaccines or even alcohol intake between mothers of cases and controls. So there was not a risk factor considering that. And if we looked, oh sorry, I went back here. Uh, if you see this cartoon, is the final result measuring the association that we had 91 cases of microcephaly and we compared with 173 controls without microcephaly. Among the cases, 35% were positive for Zika virus, and no controls were positive. This gives a huge odds ratio, uh, is a odds ratio of 73, meaning that there was really a strong evidence of this association. But what does the study also showed to us that was very difficult, and it's still very difficult, to screen neonates or to and to find positivity among neonates and children at birth, because that's when the child is born, uh, the acute infection has been such a long time that it's hard to get an RT-PCR positive at that moment, even taking all kinds of uh, biological specimens. So w another thing that I think that uh, this case control study performed during 2016 was imp important. When we got the mothers of the control, if we take the mothers of the control as the population, you could see here that considering the PRNT, that's our measure of infection, that 70% of the mothers of controls had been infected some time previous. So considering this, the first wave of Zika epidemic, this is really, a, I mean, very impressive, this number of 70% of the people infected during the first wave of the epidemic, it meant in my, it, that's not different what, what they found in the previous outbreaks in those villages, uh, those islands in the Pacific that we talked before, like the Yap Valley, uh, Yap Island, and it's not different from the numbers they're getting in other surveys, like in Salvador, Bahia. So I think that we still have 40% of susceptible in this population at that time, if we consider this uh, a, a population scenario. We have published the preliminary report of the case control. That was the first time in my life that a preliminary report of a case control study was accepted 
<laughs> in a journal because actually there was under fast track to there was really a necessity to see some evidence of the association and the final report was uh, published also uh, just with this uh, investigating all possible other explanation excluding other possible explanations for this association. So as far as I know now, uh, there isn't any doubt, there, there is a strong association and there is a close relationship between the Zika infection during pregnancy and um, birth defect. I think most of the criteria, Shepard's criteria for etiologic are already accomplished with case control study, uh, animal studies, court studies, very interesting court studies that have been done in Brazil, United States, and so on. Now, where are we now? Okay, so this figure shows the spread of Zika epidemic in Brazil according to what was reported from 2014 up to 2017, the last three years. So as we know, it started here in northeast part of Brazil. It spread toward the center of Brazil very quickly. And in less than a year, it had reached almost all states. If we look the background color, the gray color, are the dengue areas, okay? So it overlapped, not only overlapped the dengue areas, but also Zika surpassed the dengue areas. So it was, not, it was not just found in the extreme south of the country here and some remote areas of the north of Brazil. These areas here are not environmental, I mean, adequate for vector-borne disease and so it's explainable. But What's something that's very surprising with the Zika epidemic is that for dengue, it took almost, almost 10 years to do the same route from the coastal line to central Brazil. What Zika did in one year, it took dengue almost 10 years to do it. So it was something, I say, uh, very striking considering public health transmission and considering the adverse effects. And what's more important is that the unknown rate of asymptomatic case make it very difficult to, uncertain, to ascertain what is the true population level of exposure because we just have the idea what's the symptomatic cases. To know about the asymptomatic cases, we would have to have some serial surveys or other kinds of markers to know what's going on and what were the asymptomatic cases. But taking dengue as the example, example that we know better, the viral circulation in Brazil and America, it suggests that Zika will continue to circulate within human transmission cycle in the future. I think that's uh, the main message. If we see the special diffusion of microcephaly, it follows the same pattern of the Zika in adults. You see higher concentration here in the Northeast, Southeast, and then you have the cases scattered here in those areas. Now, at the beginning of the epidemic here, there were questions like, um, were the previous microcephaly register underestimated? Was it really an outbreak of microcephaly cases? Is it really a new congenital disease linked to Zika infection? And one question that people would ask us day after day was, why microcephaly was not linked to congenital disease in previous epidemic in French Polynesia? That was always the first question. 
Well, there are some possible explanations for these disparities. In Brazil, there was a huge popu naive population affected by Zika in the first wave. I show you the seroprevalence before. We had large urban population, adequate environment for transmission of vector-borne disease. In French Polynesia, we see a population of 207,000 inhabitants. Okay? It's possible that those severe outcomes weren't um, perceived. I will say, sorry, Brazilians. <laughs> okay. We're not, well, we're not recognized, let's put it this way. Now, that was exactly what happens. Uh, fetus with birth defects occurred after the first Polynesia, French Polynesia Zika epidemic. Must these congenital abnormalities were only registered retrospectively after the Brazilian alert. They had seven cases because that's compatible with their population size. There was a question of population size and the question that French Polynesian legal abortion um, or interruption of pregnancy uh, is allowed. And one thing I feel that was another different approach is that Brazil has a high coverage of public health hospitals, including hospitals, maternity hospital, where more than 80% of the babies are delivered. So the four, neonatologists, neurologists, pediatricians, were the first to suspect this cluster of severe microcephaly and what other birth defects in the maternities. And third, there was a close network of health professional research working public health systems that exchange information. I think that makes made the difference between the different sites. And that what uh, so um, that what happens. Okay. Now um, I love graphs, so I have to show you some. Here you have the <coughs> epidemiological week, and here you have the Zika cases. Uh, Brazil notification system just started in 2016 because there was no surveillance system for Zika before it. You can see the two peaks here are the north and in the northeast region. This line, I'll call it purple line, is central Brazil that just divides the north from the south part of the country. This is I think this is a great graph. So you can just see the difference between the transmission in one place and the transmission in other part of Brazil. It happened with dengue for several decades like this. Okay, Opa. sorry again. Now, if we see about microcephaly cases, those microcephaly cases, they just follow those peaks. And here is north and northeast of Brazil and the south um, different peaks. So you just had this difference in time between Zika epidemic and the population and microcephaly. Now I want to show, I, I really like this, is a chart made by our colleagues from Fiocruz. They have, um, a great group of public health workers, demographers, geographers, um, epidemiologists, public health. And they draft for me, that was one of the very good insights how to think about um, transmission of Zika virus infection. So it's like having a summary of known epidemiological features. But we still have so many questions here highlighted in blue. So if you think, we don't even know what's the, what we call reproductive number. That's the main parameter of transmission. 
That means, what is the expected number of secondary cases by a single infected case in a susceptible population? We don't know this for Zika in Brazil. Now, the other thing that's very important is that we, we are not very sure about the attack rate. We are sure there are congenital infection, okay, that Zika uh, uh, during pregnancy cause birth defects, but we're not sure what's the attack rate. Is the attack rate constant over different populations or does it vary? Is it higher in population with previous dengue exposure or not? Does previous dengue antibody enhances okay, the severity of the cases or not? So this is, this is our very interesting question. And another interesting question is about sexual transmission. You can ask me, what is the importance of uh, sexual transmission? You're staying in a place with a lot of factor. I think that vector transmission may not be important for tropical and temperate country, uh, temperate, temperate, or not so hot countries, okay, <laughs> above the equator line. But sexual transmission is very important for non-endemic countries and travelers. That's why that's a big, uh, let's say, uh, threat that uh, you say the, the people from above the equator line are in danger about Zika transmission. Tourism, travel, mobility, this is just perfect for spreading the virus, especially uh, through sexually transmission. Okay. And with other flavivirus, Zika virus can be transmitted by transfusion too. So it's very important we, th we think about blood safety. Now, but going back here to the very basic, I think that Aedes aegypti is considered the main vector of Zika in urban and suburban areas. Okay? Now we have to think about vector density, virus strain, environmental factor, such as temperature ra range. Now, another thing that's very important is that Zika originated and continues to circulate in Africa and Asia. But now we have questions. What is the probability to Zika establish as a zoonosis in our area? This is something that we have to think about, okay? And we still don't know, so there is, is still can non-human primates in Brazil be <coughs> reservoir of the Zika virus as it is in Africa and in Asia? And there are uh, still other very important uh, gaps of knowledge and about the explosive the epidemics. Is it due to viral change? Uh, what is the rate to symptomatic to asymptomatic infection? What are the prevalence of infection after the outbreaks? And as I told you before, uh, how long is Zika virus infection immunity after the first exposure? We're thinking that's lifelong, but maybe it could be less, it could be 10 years. And so, and what's more important, what's the level of background immunity to prevent the reemergence of Zika in the future? So, although case control, court studies, and animal models generate strong evidence about the association between congenital transmission and congenital Zika syndrome, we still have many, many issues to answer. Uh, one very recurrent question is why there is so much difference between transmissions of areas, uh, especially in Brazil or between Brazil and other countries. So this map of the distribution of microcephaly cases, this here was considering the first wave 
with a very, let's say, here you can see all this cluster of cases, a very high density uh, estimated by this kernel map. And the second wave here that was from May to November, you have less case. Is this unusual for vector-borne disease? I would say no. I would say no. But in order to understand transmission, I think that those global maps or those country maps, they don't tell you very much. I think transmission, to understand transmission, is necessary to produce scale maps, to say appropriate grids, to figure out parameters related to population density, mobility, vector density, temperature range, viral change, heat areas within the cities and so on. So it's when you look global, global areas, huge areas like this, it's just, uh, a, it doesn't really gives you a sense of transmission and what are the mechanisms to interrupt and transmission. So as I told you before, mandatory Zika surveillance just start in 2016. Here is no a clear pattern from Brazil. And now almost no Zika cases in 2017 <coughs> and 18. Now, what can you say? Is Zika threat over? OK, is it over? OK, my educated answer based on arbovirus infection is a big no. Despite the work done during the epidemic and post-epidemic, eh, this threat is not over, and we have no time to lose. I would like very much to quote the remarks of a paper, recent paper, by Dr. David Morris and Anthony Fossey from NIH about the Zika pandemic. The article is entitled Formidable Change to Medicine and Public Health. And they quote, it's important we do not assume that the pandemic of Zika is a one-time crisis. That can be met, controlled, and then forgotten or relegate to historical review. All the tropical world, world is now at risk and likely to remain at risk for foreseeable future. I agree entirely. I think this is what is our concern now, to think that everything is all right when we don't have more transmission and then um, uh, it's not over. Okay. So in order just to provide just my last slides to provide some insights about socioeconomic data related to microcephaly, we did an ecological study to analyze the spatial distribution of the cases in the city of Recife. Um, the capital city of this is the municipality, this capital city is located on the Atlantic coast, one of the highest population density in Brazil. Only 70% of the population is connected to the sewage system. High temperature and humidity levels remain all year round. A person environment for conditioned mosquitoes breeding site. As an indicator of living condition, we just calculate the percentage ahead of the households with income less than twice the minimum wage using the census, 2010. Now, the dark districts are the poorer living areas. And as you can see, most cases of microcephaly are in those areas. So there is really the location, the residing locations of microcephalic cases are predominantly in areas with precarious living condition compared with populations with better living condition here, this white island. 
So this study highlights the central role of the social determinants of health in this microcephaly epidemic and the unfair inequalities. I think that we have to think about improving standard living condition at neighborhood level. It should be understood as a public health intervention and part of the control measures. It's not I, th I think it's impossible to have control measures in, uh, in such an unequal uh, um, a difference, disparity, interurban disparities. Now, very interesting how Brazilians use WhatsApp to connect to Zika. And there was uh, a very good, we're in a very interconnected society. But I may, may tell you, that was my first epidemic uh, seeing the advantage for communication, but it also caused a lot of rumors and produced a lot of fake news. So I think that the, these modern epidemics, we still have to learn how to use this type of communication. It is still to be learned. So I th just think that the public health emergence launched by WHO, WHO was very important to call the world attention to the speed and to speed collaboration of international group. And this is just an example. This is the Zika Plan Consortia uh, from European Union, 25 leading research and public health organizations from Latin America, North America, Africa, Asia, and Europe, built up, are building up long-term outbreak response response, and that's very good. If you go to their site, you can see all kinds <coughs> of work packages, the protocols, and all the papers and that, that are being produced. Actually, we are working in the understanding the full spectrum of congenital Zika syndrome and in the neurologic manifestation of Zika in Recife. But several other Brazilian groups are working, investigating vaccine, uh, consider antibody-dependent enhancement, viral fitness, um, wearable repellent technologies, um, whatever, and you can name it, uh, disease burden, his risk assessment, mathematic model to inform public health policies. Our group, Microcephaly Epidemic Research Group here, is a large group of um, health professionals working together to, s to develop projects. And uh, we are very aligned with the Secretary of Health and Ministry of Health and to write guidelines. And just to see the challenge that we have ahead, we have several cohort studies that follow up pregnant women with Zika infection and non-Zika infection to answer the risk of congenital syndrome in different settings. If this risk is different, why is it different? So now, pediatric cohorts are ongoing too, and the question and the answer we, we um, want to ask what are the impairments, the neurocognitive and motor ability impairments from these children? Children. Okay, so I think this course will answer questions about the short and long-term effects of Zika infections on mothers and babies. There is much, much room for improvement in diagnosis and management of Zika-related infections. We need simple and more precise laboratory tests and clinical markers for arbovirus. This is urgent, and not only for cage management, but for screening in endemic countries. And now there is ongoing studies to assess family and societal socioeconomic impact of these infections carried out by many Brazilian groups 
and other several Latin uh, uh, American countries. And how to improve surveillance and response to emergent vector-borne disease, especially in complex urban areas, are among the most, I think, the health, public health priorities. So there are still many questions to be answered, and interdisciplinary consortia have a lot to add. Now, just thank the collaboration of National and Nas International Institute. I have the privilege to be part of the MERG team uh, during the last three years. Thank you very much for your patience. I'll be happy to answer any question. Uh, <laughs> I can help you field the question. Okay. Okay. Can I take the mic off or no? No? <laughs> I'm most worried about the microphone. <laughs> so the floor is open for questions. Um by you and then I don't know if you but you and then to Anne. Please go ahead. I have a question about you and some of your many different roles being such as yourself, or anthropologists and public health workers, what different roles do these patients play in your experience? Sorry, uh, I couldn't hear you. I hear you so 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 she it. wanted to know the different roles that anthropologists, uh, public health people, the interdisciplinary team that you work with, what were the different roles that the team members play in well, part of the research group? Uh, what I can say is that um, the first studies, there were more epidemiological and uh, trying to answer the question about the theology. It meant that that was a priority because without knowing the etiology, it would be very hard to think about control measure interrupt transmission. But this case control study, what happened is that uh, as soon as the mothers left the hospital, they were asked if they could be interviewed by, with a, a kind of, um, uh, the anthropologists and the sociologists made a kind of a family assessment about the burden of disease, okay? So uh, I think there were projects, they were connected because um, maybe they didn't interview the mothers when they were at the hospital at the first day, because uh, they were being interviewed by, uh, to know about previous exposures and things like this. But as soon as they got home, they had those registers and if they allowed, they were visited at home and they had another team with another questions to be answered by those groups with other methodologies like focal groups, qualitative research and with questions Thank you so much, very kind of you. Questions related to this. So what I found that was really peculiar with this group, MIRG, is that uh, we were uh, scientists in research from different institutions. So instead of working in our rooms in that place, we just gather in a big, let's say, meeting room that they had in the Fiocruz, Pernambuco. And it was excellent. The first day I thought we were crazy because we would stay small groups doing our different tasks. But at the end of the day, we could sit down and figure out what were the priorities and what we had done and what were the tasks for the next day and, and so on. So communication could go very fast between the groups and how we were doing. If we still have this room, okay, with a, a lot of collaboration. It's an open door, we would say, it's a <laughs> kind of, of a Zika, Zika, uh, Zika place. And uh, that was the way we tried to communicate during that crisis for the first and second year. I don't know if I answered your question, okay. The one, I mean, you're, I, it felt 
to me that your strongest point about prevention and, and addressing the issue and the ongoing threat of Zika returning is socioeconomic and, and attack rather than any other kind of um, public health measure. And I wonder if you believe that the socioeconomic, the decline in living standards and, and living conditions in 2016, 2015 explains part of why the Zika epidemic hit at that time. Um, and then also have there been any improvements in that area or are things just continuing to get worse in terms of uh, living conditions and disparities? Uh, very difficult question, I think. <laughs> well, actually, um, I start the end. I don't think it has improved anything. Even I think the crisis continues and now we are in a moment the great political crisis and I learned a, a word yesterday that I love this volatile situa oh. Oh, situation. <laughs> so you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know if it's the same here, but in Brazil now you never know uh, uh, who is going to be fired tomorrow. Does it sound familiar to you? <laughs> okay. Who is going to be fired? Who is in? Who is out? Uh, who is the next minister of health? Is there a Ministry of Health? There isn't a, a Ministry of Health anymore. There is a, a science department. There isn't a science department. So is, uh, I think, in, in a very difficult, it's a very troubled situation at the moment. I, I don't think there is any improvement. Let's see. If I think that there was a worsening condition that made Zika spread, I'm not sure I can answer this question. I think that people were saying that if you look at the states that Zika started, we had um, uh, football contacts, like a football team that came from Asia and stayed, <laughs> or from Africa and stayed in those places, okay? Uh, just after the epidemic. So they're just kind of rooting this viral entrance uh, by this m people mobility. I, I don't know how to answer this. I don't think there was, m we can feel this difference in very short period of time. But I agree with you that even if we have a good vaccine for Zika, and for dengue, okay, that we don't have for dengue yet a good vaccine, we would still have another, let's say, I don't know how many arbovirus that would hit if we still continue to have this inequality and this poverty and the lack of sanitation and so on. We must remember it's not viral disease. We must remember that filariasis was endemic in this part of the country, like in Recife, till about five years ago, that filariasis uh, has been controlled in most of Brazil for decades. Yes. That was a fantastic story. Thank you. Um, my question is about the reporting so your map that showed where Zika was in Brazil and then the cases the microcephaly cases were sort of were much lower in the in the outer in, well inland regions yes. of the country so how well do you think you actually know how many microcephalic babies there were in Brazil part mm -hmm. is one question and the other one is because it must be hard to get data from these very isolated parts of the country. And the other part of the question is, mosquitoes don't stop at borders, mm -hmm. so what's going on in the adjacent countries? I think Colombia had a big epidemic. Let's start uh, talking about other countries. Uh, Colombia didn't have, I mean, a huge numbers of microcephalic cases that was really uh, um, disturbing fact saying that no, there was no microcephaly in Colombia. But we must remember that Colombia 
the termination of pregnancy is legal and it depends of the doctors and the mothers willing uh, or health or anything. So it's not something complicated. When I, uh, I've been to Colombia many times because we have collaboration Colombia. They don't have data about abortions, but Dr. Santa was a, an increase in abortion during this period mm -hmm. and uh, that may explain some of the difference. Now, when you're talking about surveillance of microcephalic cases, here I, I agree with you that it's very sometimes difficult to compare data from one place to the other. But we can just say that Brazilian population uh, is largely urbanized at this time, at this point in time, okay? It's largely urbanized. And most of the births are within hospitals. And the microcephaly we're talking about, there are very distinct characteristics. At the beginning, uh, surveillance in the north parts of Brazil adopted a very sensitive, uh, let's say, may be thought a not appropriate measure for perimeter cephalic, like say, it was very sensitive. We, get, we would get children that were not microcephalic, but were included as microcephalic. But I, th I think even if it was, a, let's say, a mistake, let's put it this, uh, this way, it was good that gave us opportunity to understand that con this congenital infection was not only microcephaly because there were children with normal uh, cephalic perimeter that had eye abnormality, had calcification, and so on. So there was, I can say, kind of a good mistake, <laughs> if I may say so. Mm -hmm. Because in the beginning, uh, the epidemiologists from the south part of the country and the people from the birth, con uh, let's say, birth defect register, they were kind of uh, making pressure that we could just count the very severe cases, I mean, the children who were three standard deviation below from the mean according to the age. And it meant that uh, you would miss all kinds, all the spectrum if you had done so. Now, I do understand that if you're doing good epidemiologists, you would think, well, for case I need to have a very specific case definition. That's true, I agree. But if you're in the middle of an epidemic that you don't know what's going on, it's better to say that you're going to register more cases and then you're going to select the probable cases, the unlikely cases, than not doing so. But I agree with you that the surveillance system is uh, still very early. Now imagine how many times the aid surveillance system changed the case definition. <coughs> we still are struggling to, d to have a definition that can be routinely applied in the health <coughs> service concerning what, what is really congenital Zika syndrome. Okay, so I think that now we're in that stage that we're trying to tune the case definition and to make uh, data more comparable. But you're right, it's, it's difficult to compare. <coughs> if anything, it's <coughs> undercounted because of all these other symptoms besides the gross features of microcephaly that are part of the syndrome. Well, I, I don't think we are undercounting from the south, because if you think Brazil, the south part of Brazil is the more developed area, and the north is the underdeveloped area, okay? So there was, at the beginning, really a prejudice, like, uh, well, how come they're seeing those cases? I mean, they're not really cases, okay? There was a, a south-north, if I can say, kind of, uh, it's good when people say, are you sure? So you go back, you measure again, you take a picture. It's, it's part of our scientific world. I mean, it's not, uh, it's convenient to having someone to make you get the best uh, evidence to be sure that you're dealing with something new. 
but there was really not very much trust in the beginning. So to tell the truth, we were so happy when the Brazilian Minister of Health in November said it is a public emergency because it was legally the point, the turning point where saying, well, they do believe it's going on. Okay, there is something happening here. This is important and the public health alert is important. I think transmission in dif is different in different places. You don't have as much vector density in cities like Sao Paulo that you have in the northeast part of the country. Uh, in Sao Paulo, in the south, you have winter time. The other part of the country, you don't. So when you think about vector control, e I think it's likely that we'll have huge difference between countries and within areas of the same city like, like I showed here. Here in, in the city of Recife, one very interesting thing, that we just had microcephalic cases in the, in the rich area in the first six months of the epidemic. Then we didn't have it any, any longer. What does it mean? Was termination of pregnancy occurring? Was protection better? What happened? So it's clear, different access to health service, different access to protection, and so on. Those are really inequalities. Did you have a question? Um, no, that's okay. She answered it. <laughs> yes. Can you talk a bit about the experience of the mothers and the families? Um, what were their initial reactions to the diagnosis, and how are they coping now? Um, and also to go off of that, are there any um, actions being taken or programs in place to help the families raise the children? Yeah. I think. As it was a great commotion, social commotion, okay, uh, these kids were, uh, there were, there are now special reference service, okay, health service, where try to give all kind of, um, say, um, care, with me, ophthalmologic care, uh, and so on. But considering they're poor families, Okay, uh, even if they get like, say, uh, kind of a disability wage because of the kid, it's still very little. And it, I think it's a very hard for the family. It is very hard for the family. So what else can I say to you? I think that I feel that we do have an extra burden for the health service and a huge burden for the families. Yeah. You can imagine all things that can happen because in this area of the country where the epidemic hit very strong, this is a place also where an unplanned pregnancy is very high and you have a lot of teenagers, pregnant teenagers. So uh, it was something very uh, emotionally uh, difficult to see, very young girls with uh, children with very small heads having convulsion or very irritable children. And uh, everything that the family has to, to do to cope with that new situation. I think that we are far from getting the adequate uh, treatment for everyone, but I think there has been a, a, uh, an effort, a public health effort to do it. And Brazilian, up to now, has, <laughs> has a health system, a public health system. We don't know how long it's going to last, but we hope it's going to last, but it's a public health system. Yes. Um, did you collect data about when they believed they were infected with Zika, and then were you able to sort of 
see what if it mattered when they were infected during the yeah, That's a very good question. We did. But what happened is that there are a lot of asymptomatic infection. That was the main characteristic of Zika infection. And so most mother would say, well, I had a rash or I had something very mild, but kind of a, a rash thing during early pregnancy. But others didn't say anything and they had birth effects. So this is something that gets very difficult when you think about symptoms. But we did get got this data for in our uh, here in our case control study was half and half half of the kids uh, born with some kind of um, uh, impairment had mothers who had 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 and so we can tell uh, the difference uh, would make uh, the data wouldn't help us to think about it yes do you think that these biological phenomena had um, some effect on changing the opinion of Brazilians about abortions? Mm -hmm. Well, at the beginning we thought it would. I think you're better, okay, you could. You, you have a paper about it. I don't, please. <laughs> From my rough analysis of it, it initially looked like it could potentially open a wedge, you know, towards the liberalization or the expansion of the you know, criteria in which abortion is allowed. However, that those conversations and with the volatile, the, our new word, political environment, those really shut down. The other thing to mention about that is even if that had happened, the discourse that was being used was really a discourse of kind of prevention and kind of health emergency around, you know, diseased, undesirable babies. It wasn't kind of a women's rights or a, you know, kind of reproductive rights discourse. It was like a health exception um, this course. It, the situation is different in Colombia, as you mentioned, where there are more uh, openings and possibilities, and then you know other countries differ uh, greatly across Latin America in terms of the how liberal or even it, to what extent of abortion access and laws exist. But it seems like you know, and there's actually a lot of restrictions. There's you know, and it's class because those who can you know afford it can go to a private clinician or even could get medication abortion access to that mm -hmm. pharmacological you know within a certain time frame but for the kinds of communities that you're talking about you know um, it, uh, that just really w was not accessible I mean I think there's the documentary uh, by Denise um, what is her Denise, name? Denise 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 it, yeah so that kind of chronicles the experiences of a range of women um, and you see that there was, appears to be a few cases where actually pregnancy terminations occurred, but they can't say that because then they'd be running a foul of the law. So mm -hmm. others know more th uh, as much mm -hmm. as I do about this as well. I mean, that's, it just mm -hmm. seems like it, it didn't, and now, you know, again, the political situation is so unstable that it's definitely, there are groups fighting for that, and they might ally themselves with public health folks, but it's really not going anywhere. I think there, there are very strong women's group in Brazil. Yes. I mean, they're very organized, and they um, they have representatives at a political level. But at the moment, I think everything is seems to be kind of uh, going in the the other direction. Okay, especially with this uh, current president and. We don't know what's going to happen. We hope we get a more liberal group, but at the moment it doesn't look like. The Congress is very conservative Congress. Senate, very conservative Senate, very influenced by religious uh, groups, um, strong um, opposed to any kind of abortion. Yes? take one or two more questions. Thank you, Selena. Um, this is, uh, we talked about it a little bit at lunch yesterday, but uh, this notion of kind of the virus du jour, right? Like in the in the US, we freaked out about Zika, but before that we freaked out about H1N1, and we freaked out about Ebola. And you mentioned about um, how it's clear that Zika is going to come back and this is something that we should be paying attention to. And I'm wondering if uh, you could just speak 
to, especially given the volatile uh, notion of the political moments that both in the US and in Brazil, um, how we can pay attention, how we can like keep the momentum going and have people continue to think about Zika even though, at least in the US, right, we've long forgot about Zika because it's not impacting us um, mm -hmm. in, a, in a direct kind of way. I don't, I don't know if it's the same in Brazil at this moment, but how do we continue from a public health standpoint to make it a priority even when the public doesn't think it's a priority or the government doesn't think it's a priority or anyone thinks it's a priority? Yeah. It was a very good question. I think that Zika now is within 10 priority virus from WHO, okay, uh, in their blue blueprint, mm -hmm. where they have the, the what are the 10 most important virus that we have to talk about. That's a good thing because it wasn't even, we didn't even think about it. I remember that the, uh, the communication of the Brazilian government was don't worry about Zika. Report it as dengue. That's why we put dengue like. Report it dengue. <laughs> dengue kills and look for chikungunya. Chikungunya that's important because impairment, because we didn't have the right knowledge about it or the knowledge about it. So, uh, what I think that communication at this point is important, and I think that Zika is different from other arbovirus because of the sexual transmission. Mm -hmm. So sexual mm -hmm. transmission may, may make a lot of difference because you may not be worried about dengue, but if you're going to visit some paradise islands, I don't say if you, even if you're going to go to Brazil, I, I advise you to go, but if you go to, <laughs> to other like French Polynesia or anything like this, you have to pay attention if you don't get the virus and then you come home and you can, uh, say, transmit inland. So I think transmission is important. Another worth saying is that it looks like the virus has a prolonged life in semen. It means around six months. So we are getting here to, to, to something that's important because uh, it's not a trivial to say, oh, safe sex for, for long, or test yourself, or test your wife. It's kind of getting complicated. And I think when we're talking about congenital infection, and congenital infection at this severe as it is, I don't think that we should minimize the risks, the, the risks. And but how to do it in public health, that's, that's a good question. But I think communication is good. Com I think media communication, m try to get this idea that unless you do have preventive measures or a good vaccine, you should continue in this alert sign. Um, do you think something, um, could you, could you I mean, do you have any ideas how we could? You, you, you had a good question. You should have a good answer, too. <laughs> uh, my CDC days are behind me. <laughs> um, uh, but I would agree with you that, that there's got to be um, a multi-pronged approach with um, high level of communication. But this, this has, to be, has to be prioritized, right? And at least in the US, um, with the wind, money comes and goes to the newest thing, and when it has a priority, then there's a bolster of people who get hired to work on things, and a bolster of money, and um, and then just as easily, it can all go away. Um, and so I, I, I guess the question is like, what happens when you're in a state of lack? And, mm -hmm. and at least in the US, we are not a preventive type of public health place where we, we're thinking in advance, we're very reactive, mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, it's not just about Zika, it's about many things, and I think this conversation happens and, and we all get worried about the next, the next thing, and the next thing could just be a recycle of Zika. Um. <laughs> Maybe we'll take one more question, if anyone has some questions on the floor. Well, if not, thank you for such an informative and fascinating. Thank you.
It was very nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much.